transition into our conversation for tonight. We are kind of, it's interesting, we started this conversation about how to be people that are experiencing healing and are being people of healing in the world. And it's really turned into a, a topic about how to have healing conversations, especially when we're talking to people that we don't um, agree with or we have struggles with. Um, we're talking about how to be people that interact like Jesus with other people in the world. Uh, so we've been drawn from a lot of the wisdom of the New Testament letters because that's where real people, even though they lived a long time ago, that's where real people had the life and teachings of Jesus in front of them and they were wrestling with how do we live this out practically in our lives? How does it reshape the way we form community and talk to each other and live in this world? Um, and that's what all those letters are, is them writing back and forth to each other, providing wisdom and, and guidance as they wrestled through this. And I use wrestle really intentionally because they didn't always agree with each other. Uh, uh, they're letters. Uh, and sometimes they had different views and different opinions and different perspectives on things. Uh, so we've been looking at uh, kind of five guidelines for healing conversations. Each week I say, this is something we're kind of building together. And it's not, it's not in any way like a five-step uh, practice for all your conversations going great. That's, um, that's the bestseller book we'll write later. But for now, <laughs> this, is, this is just a good conversation together. Um, and so another, another qualifier here. I'm about to talk about the election, but I'm not about... To, I'm not <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to talk about politics, okay? There's a difference there. Uh, and I'm going to talk about it for a second because um, this is real life and it would be silly if we didn't talk about the real things that are going on around us. And here's all I wanna say about it um, because it really applies to the conversation that we're gonna to have today. Uh, and that is this, in going over some of the, I've just listened to a few people talking and read some articles going over some of the data um, about what this election revealed about who we are as a culture and a society. Okay, so again, we're not talking about one side or the other. We're not talking about any of that stuff. Uh, talking about that it revealed that we are becoming increasingly, increasingly tribal in the way that we think and act and interact with others. We're creating zero sum systems where uh, the person I was watch, uh, actually listening to on the radio said, when was the last time you saw politicians or senators from two opposing parties um, interacting with each other and talking or being near each other? And they were lamenting that uh, when that does happen, the few times it does, um, through social media and other means, the whoever's, whoever's side tried to, to reach across the aisle they get lit on fire on social media for, um, you know, participating with the enemy. Um, it's a zero sum culture um, that is being created, uh, which reflects an inability to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, and so the election is just kind of like this week's issue. Uh, <laughs> I want to say, and that's why I'm, I'm mentioning that word, and we're going to be done talking about it from there on out. But it's not just that. It happens in a lot of other areas of life. Um, there, these are symptoms, um, and there are there are deeper issues, which is why it is so important that we talk about how to communicate and have healing conversations. Um, because there's a we we've talked about some of the symptoms, and you know, sure, social media has played a role in that. Um, our politics have played a role in it. I'm a pastor, so I can say this, the church has played a role in it. Um, and we all individually have also played a role in it. We, we've all, we're all participants in this. Um, so that's why it's important to experience healing ourselves. That's why it's important to be able to say, I'm sorry, when we, when we contribute to it um, and to move on into healing. So let me share some good news. I have this really quote, uh, I have this really quote, I have this really, quote, I have this great quote I found. I've been doing some reading about culture forming. Um, it says this, no matter how complex and extensive the cultural system you may consider, the only way it will be changed 
is by an absolutely small group of people who innovate and create a new cultural good. I'm gonna read that one more time <laughs> to this small group right here. <laughs> no matter how complex and extensive the cultural system you may consider, the only way it will, be, it will be changed is by an absolutely small group of people who innovate and create new cultural good. So it may feel like everything is just so big and everything is so complex and the world, so if you've even mentioned in what you shared, the world feels so crazy right now, that can lead to apathy, that can lead to feelings of there's nothing I can do about this. Um, but we each have our own circles that we communicate with. We each have these conversations that are possible. Um, and we each have each other. And we're walking in the tradition, this tradition of the Jesus way where people um, have been bridging divides and having healing conversations and being communities of healing for thousands of years. Here's what uh, Jesus's friend Peter said in one of his letters that I think is kind of Peter's version of that quote. He says, you are a chosen people. You are like royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of love, goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. So that's why we're here and having these discussions today. We started with talking about listening and that being the posture that we begin our conversations in. Last week, we talked about viewing everyone in God's image, and that being a, a starting place, a, a ground of, of commonality and beginning point to see that value in each person. Uh, we talked about not creating a single story of the people that we interact with and not being judgmental. And tonight we're going to start, let me share my screen here. You can... Uh, Find this online if you want to take a look at it on our website, hopesparta.org, um, under Healing Conversations, right there. Tonight, we're going to start with this third one, the approach in conversation, and that is humility rooted in love. And so we have two, two passages that we're going to uh, kind of begin with, both from writings of Paul. Uh, I'm going to start with this one from Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, which is kind of that famous passage where Paul describes love. He starts, you know, love is patient, love is kind. Um, and towards the end of that, he starts talking about how um, we see but poorly uh, as reflection in a mirror. He's kind of saying like, it's almost like what we see now is limited. It's like looking through a foggy mirror. Um, and his point is that with love as the guiding motivation of our life, we should be willing to acknowledge that we see things limited now, but someday we'll see things more clearly. Um, and I, th I think that is such a beautiful reminder um, to go into conversations with, this sounds simple, um, but go into a conversation with the assumption that you don't know everything. <laughs> go into a conversation with the assumption that you have things to learn. That maybe something, even someone you disagree with might have an angle or a perspective on something that has something really beautiful and valuable for you that you otherwise might have missed. Um, I think that is uh, what Paul is getting started with here. We're going to go to this other verse in a second. But first, I'd like to throw out a conversation question for all of you. And that is, um, why do you think it might, let me, let me rephrase this, I'm rephrasing it on the fly, but how can we enter into conversations with a more open mind? Because I think that is an easy value to hold and say, yes, this is important to me but it's also really easy for your brain to switch off when um, people start talking and you get flustered and, and angry or something like that. So how, what, what are some good practices for entering into a conversation with humility of an open mind? Um, one thing that I, I can't quite remember what I just read on that Paul 
on humility, but there was, a, a, I think the second phrase of that sentence, he said to be tolerant of other people's faults. And I, you know, 2000 years later, I would beg to change that uh, with all due respect to Paul. Um, I would say to be tolerant of other people's beliefs because faults immediately puts you into the category that there's a measuring rod and that this person didn't meet that, that, that requirement or that belief and therefore they have a fault. Uh, so even though I know that we're all imperfect, I would, I would rephrase that as the beliefs, especially today. Um, even though I know that during Paul's time, there was an enormous profusion of different belief systems. It's a really, it's a really good observation, John. Um, that uh, that idea of, of if we're talking about posture, you, you immediately have chosen a posture of judgment before before you've chosen a posture of grace um, by virtue of just uh, starting with the faults. And and uh, and and by the way, I'll you know I'll overlook those, but I have a list of them. <laughs> uh, that's a it's a good it's a good observation. With, with with this one, one thing that I I just uh, um, I en I enjoy about uh, getting to know people who are uh, maybe on the surface unlike me is just kind of that visual of the uh, of the concentric circles and and having curiosity about what that that circle we have in common, what where the overlap might be, um, as a as sort of an entry point to uh to the other side of the circle of, of all the things that are unique and different about this person um that uh that they might share if if there is some sort of overlap you know sometimes sometimes folks are more more comfortable sharing if if they feel like uh there's some sort of you know commonality that that you have you're not just a foreign other um and so kind of taking that, that, that sort of fun, curious mindset of, I wonder what we have in common. <laughs> See if we can figure it out. <laughs> I think even beyond that too, um, I listened to a podcast a little while back and I shared it with Ben and I shared it with Christine uh, Shope. It was Oshita Moore, I'll put it in the chat in just a second, but she was talking about empathy, uh, developing empathy in your life, especially for people that um, are sometimes hurtful to, to you or that you don't see eye to eye with. Um, and she just talked about the importance similar to that of giving that person a little bit of a backstory, even if you have, kind of have to like stretch a little bit and make up what, um, what their story could be, but what, has shaped their perspective? What culture have they grown up in where um, maybe they just don't know any different? They don't know the better words that they could have used, you know, giving them a little bit more grace um, and, and trying to put yourself in their shoes a little bit so that instead of just jumping down their throats and saying, you know, you've offended me and we can't continue having this conversation, trying to see where they're coming from at least not to say that it's okay or that you should allow people to hurt you but to understand why they said things the way that they did sort of listening to um, understand and not respond because i think a lot of times we immediately go into a conversation in defense mode and we already have in our mind the things that we want to defend rather than listening to what they have to say to understand why they think that way. Uh, 
years ago, I had a friendship. I think I mentioned this, I don't know how many meetings ago, but um, losing track of that. But I had a friendship uh, with, a, with a gentleman who, who he and I had a lot of interesting conversations together. Uh, but at some point, um, he did something which I felt was very unethical. Uh, it had something to do with money. And uh, I was very confused. I was caught between a sword and a hard rock, like, what do I do? And I felt that I, it was healthy to end this relationship. So I just waited for some advice from, I used to call it higher forces, you know, benevolent spirits or whatever, God. Uh, I left the gate open. And, um, and I, got, I got the information that I just needed to put the emphasis, the, the, the burden on myself, not accuse him of anything. So when I, and I ended the conversation by not agreeing to go to lunch with him. We used to do that almost every day. And he, he said, why? And I said, I just don't have the emotional strength and maturity to continue in this relationship. And he said, okay. And I think he understood why, but I took the, I took the onus of, instead of saying, you did this, you did that, you know, and so on. And it was true. I, I, I didn't have the emotional maturity to turn my other cheek, you know, I love the enemy or any of that. I didn't have that strength. So I, I, I was honest in that respect. And that ended the relationship, which I think I think was healthy for both of us. I think this is a, a good good transitional point into that second verse that um, John, you've already brought up here. I'm still going to pull it up. Um, here we go. Paul says, always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And that was the, John, the one you pointed out a few minutes ago. Um, and I think we've talked about this before, but I always want to point out that when, when we see sentences like this, especially in Paul's writing, it can be really easy, especially if you maybe grew up in certain faith communities to think like, oh, this is a list of rules. Um, but really, this is, that's not what's going on here. This is, remember, these are letters. This is um, loving guidance and support and advice. Um, it's really kind of a picture of what it looks like to enter, uh, to live life as Jesus lived. Um, I hopped on Facebook for about five minutes today, which sometimes is a mistake and sometimes not uh but it was really cool i i noticed uh, christine showed you posted some kind of graphic from this very passage it was really cool looking um and so i kind of wanted to dissect this a little bit and talk about what these things look like in our everyday lives um, and starting with being humble and gentle uh and let's talk about humility because i think that is a let's call it a value that can sometimes be, um, uh, the word I'm, looking, I'm trying to get to false humility. Like you can kind of enter into a conversation with false humility, kind of like exaggerated humility that really is more about putting focus on you. Um, so <laughs> what does true humility look like? How would you describe it? And what does it look like in a conversation? Um, I heard a great quote the other day or read it, I think. Um, Elizabeth, you went back on mute after you said I heard a good quote. Okay. <laughs> I heard a good quote um, and basically said, assume that if you had gone through the same things that this person had gone through, that you would be in the same place that they are. Just 
give them the benefit of the doubt because it's almost it's kind of arrogant to assume that well i would i would know you know what i think that you should know right now or what i think that you should believe right now if i were you when really if we just assumed i i wouldn't be doing this any better you know i wouldn't be any further along or i wouldn't be believing differently or whatever you know if i if i were in the same same position i thought that was helpful in terms of being humble yeah and it doesn't it doesn't uh, uh it doesn't stop you from having a forward-looking conversation and relationship but it but it does uh, give you a posture of humility about what's behind us mm -hmm. what's behind you might be different than what's behind me and and now we're both kind of bringing unique perspective into what's ahead of us or what's what's in front of us yeah, yeah I, like, I like that and there's not an um sort of implication that I'm a better person than you, right. you know, <laughs> like, let's assume that we're both equally good people who are trying to do a good job or whatever. And that it's our experiences that are putting us in a different position. I think it's important. I think I sh I think I shared similar to John. I don't know what week this was, but I shared that I, ha I have a, a professor this, this semester in my doctor program who, who's done all these big, you know, amazing things and had these big, amazing failures. Uh, like hundred million dollar failures of, of this or that. And, and he talked about one of the themes of his failures was that anytime anybody disagreed with him, he assumed that they were either stupid or immoral. <laughs> and, uh, and he learned over time that that was not a very good uh, set of assumptions to go into relationships with <laughs> and into conversations and debates with. And uh, those things ended up uh, surprise, surprise, kind of exploding and in, in those relationships ended up exploding in his face. Um, but it's kind of the antithesis of what you're talking about mm -hmm. here. I think we go into conversations with people sometimes with an agenda that I will listen to you, but then I'm going to help you see it my way or show you where you're wrong. Instead of going in with an agenda, I have seen uh, changed mine a little bit and went, okay, I want to learn from your side so I can change my viewpoint. And almost always my viewpoint, I mean, not totally, but has increased or changed and gave me more information. And it's just going in with the mindset, I truly want to hear you. I'm not thinking of the next thing I want to say or that I will listen to you so I can change you. Um, I have a psychological term for, for that, and that's called conceptual narcissism. And I think that narcissism has a lot to do with humility. That to see what's going on inside of oneself, instead of judging everybody, say, oh, that person is this and that person is that. But to actually see the narcissist in yourself, sometimes we refer to it as that ego even though that, that is a historical uh, misinterpretation of Freud, the Freud's uh, concept. But it's close, you know, where we think that, um, like we are, the, we are the measure of reality. And anybody that sort of goes past that threshold makes us feel bad. And then it becomes aggressive narcissism. Um, and we've seen quite a bit of that. I had a brief conversation many years ago in the early weeks of a class and a classmate in conversation just happened to tell me that she used to be a member of a cult, um, true full-fledged mind control cult. And with reference to not having something to say, because they didn't, or that I was willing to say, I just said, wow. And she came back the next day and said, you know, I haven't really said this. I'm just starting to be able to say this now because I've been afraid of what people might say to me, like, how could you get yourself into that? It was the you know one that floats to the top fairly quickly. Um, and she said, I just appreciated that there wasn't any judgment about this situation that I came out of. And of course, I didn't have anything to say to that either. But um, 
sometimes it's good to not really have anything to say. She just wanted to feel like she could speak about something that happened without getting into a big dissection of it. Christine, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I do think that sometimes that can be the most humble response is just to say, wow, or acknowledge and affirm their feeling, um, but not really give your input one way or another. I think that's what a lot of people long for, just to be heard and acknowledged. Um, I was going to say, oh, I was going to say words that we hardly ever hear from people because they're hard to say are apologies. I'm sorry when I've hurt you. I'm sorry when I've done something wrong. And I can probably remember like maybe eight or nine times in my life when I've experienced an authentic apology from somebody who has hurt me because we don't really, we don't really take the time to do that sometimes. Either the circumstances have blown over and we just know that, you know, we're okay and we're going to move forward, but we don't take the time to go back and say, I'm sorry for what I said and the way that I said it. Um, and I think that shows a lot of humility when you're willing to go back. And I know in my heart, there have been a lot of times where I'm like, I don't want to say it. <laughs> and that's where I know that humility still has a long way to go because I wouldn't be feeling that way if I was purely humble. Um, I just lost the thought, but it'll come back in a second. Uh, the idea of, of that I, I kind of think of any kind of spiritual system that it has a goal. And I think of Christianity, that to me, the goal has always been to awake, to awaken. And I think that when I think of humility in that context, it makes a lot of sense. Because to awaken means that you are open, you're an open system. And that humility allows you to be open. It allows you to be sensitive and look to yourself and to other people. And so I think in that context, it's a very useful um, state of mind and state of heart. kind of along with what um what kylo is saying I'm, i've been trying to pay attention i heard another great quote that was forgiveness is a relent it's a letting go of fear or so it was i don't know i've been trying to look at things both in when i'm thinking why am i responding to this person this way why do i feel so like i can't just sit here and listen to them say this because it's wrong you know <laughs> or it's gonna it's it's wrong and it's damaging and i need to say something you know all those all those feelings um and trying to ask myself, what is the fear that's underlying this? What is the fear that is stopping me from being able to just let this person have their view right now and say what they need to say? And then even thinking about when they're getting angry and you can tell they're angry and they're not letting go of something. What is the fear that's really at the basis of all that? And that's been interesting because it does make it does make me stop and look at things a little bit differently. Yeah, I think there can be a response there too, like acknowledging the fear in, say you are in a conversation where someone is um, really, you feel they're against you or you feel like you're struggling to get along with them or having an impasse that's not some huge boundary breaking issue. Um, it, it can, I was just reading a book about this last week. It really reveals more about you and, and what is going on within you than it does um, the other person. Um, and it can really, I think that can be a, a, a way to enter into conversation with humility is to say, what does my feelings about this person say about myself? And where, where can I let God be at work in my life? Or where can I work through some of these things um, so that I can be more loving? Which then in a way sort of opens you up to your curiosity about your own, your own journey in a really constructive way of, huh, wow, where does that come from? You know, where, where does that fear uh, come from or that reaction come from? And there's, there's a whole journey that can take place there that you can either be closed off to or, or open to as well. 
Yeah, I've um, heard heard it said whenever you experience an emotional trigger, that's where X marks the spot, the sort of just flag to become curious about that and then sort of start digging, <laughs> start uh, uncovering the layers of why there's some sort of emotional trigger there. Mm -hmm. so being curious over shutting down. And that's where, and John, you've got me really curious now. I really, I don't have access to it in this moment, but I really want to go back and look at the Greek for that word fault. Um, you've, I've just, I've honestly just been sitting here thinking about that the whole time. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but I think that's um, based on what you just said, Lauren, I think that could be part of what that is addressing too, is that we all have those triggers and those deeper journeys that we need to take that sometimes those, um, those, those show up in a lot of different ways on our side and on the other side of conversation. Let's talk about um, another word in that verse. Uh, we're actually going to try to talk about two more. Um, the first one is gentle. Um, Paul says, always be humble and gentle. Always be humble and gentle. Always be humble and gentle. Uh, always is kind of a big word there. And then... Um, I just, I just think anytime the word gentleness shows up, I think, wow, what a, what a countercultural word. Um, and maybe this is my experience as growing up as a man in our culture, but I never really felt like anyone was like, you should value gentleness. Um, it's it's, not, it's not, not broadly proclaimed yet. Um, it's one of the fruit of the spirit. It is um, something that Jesus is often described as being. Uh, and here we see it as um, a really important value. Um, so what do you all think about that? Do you, do you think gentleness belongs in, in these types of conversations? And what, what, what practical ways are there to, to be gentle in uh, 2020? I think gentleness... has to be intentional right now. I think we have to be very intentional about our part in these potentially confrontational conversations. And I don't know if you wanna have a, a, you really can't have a limit on them. Cause like you said, there could be triggers that set you off, but you have to, we have to be the ones to start with this gentleness in our culture or it's never gonna happen. And I understand, you know, there are goals that we want to achieve and, and maybe we didn't get it, but you know what, we have to then find another way to get to that point. And again, we have to take it upon ourselves, each and every one of us. And if we can do that, it's not gonna happen. You, you brought up the election. It's not gonna happen in government unless we hold them accountable to act that way. And I don't know if that will ever happen. I don't know how we can communicate that to them other than it showing that ourselves and acting that way intentionally. I like that intentional gentleness. That's a good, that's a good phrase. You even call it tough minded gentleness. <laughs> I, I, I totally agree, Mindy. I, I think that it's a good point that that's never, it's not just going to happen. It, it, it's going to require us to uh, live that out and, and, and insist on, on that being a norm that we, a norm and a value that we elevate um, and celebrate. Uh, because right now, culturally, it's just not like there's just no. There's no TV show <laughs> you know, where, where that, that type of a value is elevated. Uh, it's quite the opposite. It's drama and it's conflict and it's who's the, you know, who's the strongest, whatever, in whatever context. It, it's an outrage culture. It and is, yeah. Who can be the most outraged? That's right. Exhausting. I had the privilege of working um, as a camp counselor at an all-girls camp for a year while I was in college. And the camp director was just a woman of such wisdom. 
And as she was training us as counselors, she actually had us make a bracelet with those little letter beads that said gentleness and to wear it. And she reminded us constantly that our job was in caring for young women. And the words that we use matter, the way that we say them matter, the ways that we treat the girls and treat each other matter. And she had such a high policy. It was on an island. It was like all about empowering these young girls to grow up and, and be strong, gentle young women. And she had such a high policy of no gossip, no criticism, no comparison. And I just love it was always through the lens of treating these girls as very vulnerable, young, shapeable people and remembering that gentleness in the way that we shape them, that we don't wanna break them. We don't want to bruise them. We want to raise them up to be strong. And I will never forget. It was such a powerful lesson for me to learn at that age. I'll never forget that. Now, uh, in my days of doing a little counseling, I used to use types and I know that not everybody believes in typologies, but they're just like tools. They're not really like truths, but they do help. And uh, they're, and I encountered two types. Uh, of course, there were many, but active types and passive types. Uh, active types are outgoing, they're blunt, they're physical, they're energetic, they're extroverts in many cases. And passive types are more introverted. They might be gentle, they might be quiet, and so I think of, you know, different active types, like for instance, Mahatma Gandhi was a, a passive type, uh, what we used to call a lunar type, uh, introverted, but he used his passivity and his gentleness to, to change the society. Uh, so he, he kind of, so each type will, and it's very hard to find an act, when an active type tries to be gentle, it's almost like a football player coming to you with a little flower. You know, and it's kind of very clumsy. And you kind of want to laugh, but that's the best they can do, you know. This makes me think of um, the saying where, you know, before you speak, ask yourself, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? I more times than not forget to ask myself that. <laughs> I wish I could practice that better. Um, and even after asking those questions, you know, I like the line, you know, is it necessary? I think for me, that's the most important one because it might be true, but is it my job to expose it or to tell it or, um, and, and if it is something that, you know, I feel like I, I need to share on or with somebody about, um, you know, when you're talking about truth and being honest, there's a big difference between uh, honesty that is gentle and brutal honesty. And, you know, and unfortunately, I think sometimes brutal honesty can um, be wrongly justified because it's truth. And uh, so, you know, and I think about the golden rule you know, which do unto others, you would have them do unto you. Now that I'm much better at, you know, that will stop me. And I can think, you know, I don't want to treat somebody in a way that I don't want to be treated and, um, or speak to somebody in a way I wouldn't want to be spoken to. And, you know, and so, and that includes um, when something does happen and there is a conversation and someone does speak to me unkindly and without gentleness and all that, you know, it, it takes a lot of, uh, I guess that's where the discipline comes in and, you know, and the restraint to not fire back in the same manner, um, you know, and to take a deep breath and step back. I find it most difficult with those I'm closest to, especially family, family members, um, and finding common ground you know, and I've heard a lot of that here. I've just heard some really good stuff here tonight and I appreciate listening to it. Um, 
but you know finding that common ground with with people when I'm with them because I know that we we're all connected and we all have things in common you know um we could come from totally opposite polar opposite beliefs in different corners of the world and we can still find commonality and you know so that that's one of the things that I do try to do and and I often will um share a piece of myself first you know and you know, because, and and the last thing I want to say is I was sitting here and listening and thinking humility to me, um, like a definition is, but for the grace of God, because um, I know that, you know, I, I'm no better and I'm no worse than anybody. Not to say I don't ever feel that way. You know, I certainly do. Um, but to remember the truth about that and, you know, and to know that, you know, I can't understand everything if I've not experienced it, but to know that it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen to me or I couldn't do something that I disagree with or I'm judging or whatever. And, and I love the curiosity thing because I went to a workshop where a woman, you know, said when you catch yourself kind of judging, stereotyping, say you're, you're in Walmart and somebody's wearing something and you immediately think, you know, and to catch that. And, you know, and she says, and just say one thing to yourself. Well, isn't that curious? You know, and I love that because it really does bring it back to you, to me, you know, because it's like curious, but then it brings it back to me because it put me in check and it said, you're making an assumption, a judgment, you're quick to stereotype. Isn't that curious? Well, Linda, why did you just do that? You know, so yeah, thanks everybody for sharing what you shared. I like that, Linda. Um, yeah, don't get mad, get curious. Um, I was thinking when we were talking about gentleness, about um, if we realize that we're all one one body of Christ and we're all connected, if we were to, you know, as we're walking and look down and realize we've got cuts on the bottom of our foot and say, whoa, you know, what's going on here? And just very gently, tenderly, take the leaves and the brush and just sort of go through to, to take care of that wound and to just see it as part of our body that has been neglected or that we have just been running through the woods and not realizing that we're hurt. And so just to see how taking that time and just to nearly with gentleness, nurturing that part of ourself. Um, I think we would be healed as a body of Christ if we can see that we we are attacking our own body whenever um, rather than healing working towards healing yeah and Lauren honestly you know the hardest part of that is the people who are the loudest and the neediest and the most difficult to love are usually the ones that are hurting the most and it's such a hard perspective to remember and and so hard to to face that person with all the things that you want to say and want to throw back at them, but to remember they are hurting and there is a reason why they're voicing themselves in this way and to try to back up and get into that conversation. And sometimes that's not the time and the place to do that, but just to try to keep that perspective, this is a hurting person. And uh, if I'm gonna engage them, it needs to be in a healing way. Yeah, I really like that idea of, of just what if we had the mindset that we are all part of one body. I mean, that's a it's a very it's a very Christian concept and 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 other you know faith and, and spiritual traditions, but it's it's a pretty fundamental shift in mindset uh, if we, if we are all part of one body versus we are all just sort of on our islands or our fragments and. And it's us versus them, our tribe versus their tribe. One of us is going to win. One of us is going to die. You know, we just want to be on the winning side um, versus we are all part of the same body and, and we got to take care of each other. Um, and I, I feel like along with the, the, the shift in mindset and that sort of ownership of or elevation of, of, kind of gentleness as a value to, to Minnie's point earlier is maybe a redefinition of what strength is. 
So is, is strength flying off the handle and throwing every kind of uh, insult and judgment and whatever at the person because it's my tribe versus your tribe and I got to win. I got to be on the surviving side of this or, or is it, we're all part of, um, we're all part of the same, you know, same body. And, and there is, I need to be strong in my, uh, you know, adoption of the, this is, we have a sign of, of that, uh, Linda, I think that you brought up <laughs> for, for the, for the kids and for ourselves. And, uh, and as, I mean, as adults with kids, th this comes up, right? You realize that as an adult, strength takes a different strength is not flying off the handle um and and hurting them you know strength is 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 pulling it together <laughs> and 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 operating on this on, on this set of values that you want them to operate on that strength and that and that's what makes a difference in in their their upbringing and our upbringing i think another definition of um gentleness is vulnerability which is another thing that is not, not only not valued, but I think feared, yeah. highly feared. Um, but really that's the key to opening that bridge between you and another person, that willingness to be vulnerable and trying to, I think in the conversation I was listening to about that, it was the idea that what really is brave, what really is strong, doesn't it take a lot of courage and strength to be vulnerable just as much as to be dominating or, or to never be hurt by anything. Yeah, I think a lot of like what I've gotten out of this conversation is just like, I think I've always thought of like strength and like gentleness as being opposites, but like there's a lot of strength in being gentle and like because it's so much easier to like, I don't know, to like be truthful or like be hurtful and write that off as like, well, you're telling the truth and like you're helping someone. Um, but like, it takes a lot more strength to like, take the time and, and really think and like, um, process what you're going to say before you say it. Um, and I like also, you know, by being gentle to someone else, it helps improve their strengths and helps build them up. Um, so I think that instead of thinking this is like two opposite things, I think about them more of like hand in hand and there is a lot of strength in being gentle. Yeah, and, it, and it's almost like the, there's a similar relationship between being, uh, I'm going to say, like, smart or right mm -hmm. and being curious, right? It's sort of like the gentleness strength thing, so that there, there's a lot of intelligence that it takes to be curious versus, versus no. you know, <laughs> uh, uh, black and white right, um, and similar to, to the gentleness and strength dynamic, like. And the vulnerability to the, the idea of being willing to be the person who's wrong first. Mm. You, want, you know, the one who's the first one to say, okay, I'll admit that I'm wrong about this. And yeah. then the other person can decide to re respond. You, just like you were saying with the apology, Kyla, like not qualifying our apologies. It's <laughs> like, I'm sorry that you thought that, you know? <laughs> which is usually like what you want to do. <laughs> but having that to be brave enough to say, all right, you know what? I was wrong about this and then open that door for it to be okay for that person to also admit where they were wrong. Yeah. Or the vulnerability in like saying that you don't know. Like, I feel like there's a stigma yeah. around like you always have to know. And even if you don't know, you can just like pretend like you know and that causes a lot of <laughs> issues. But like that vulnerability and like being honest and being curious and being like, I don't know, like teach me or like tell me what you know. Well, adding on to that, something I've often said to um, kids I've worked with is that sometimes the questions are more important than the answers to help you learn how to think and to learn how to know and to explore. Um, and another piece I'd like to add is I used to have a teacher who had a poster saying there is nothing so strong as real gentleness, nothing so gentle as real strength. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a Native American poster. I don't know if it's truly a Native American saying or someone was just putting two things together. But. 
I like that. Uh, also, I think a lot of times that black and white thinking doesn't serve doesn't serve me well. Like I have to remember there's a gray area because sometimes nobody's wrong, you know, and that's kind of hard too. Um, you know, so I've learned a lot about, you know, agreeing to disagree, you know, and, and that just speaks to having different beliefs and different values and different ways of doing things um, and that being okay. Like there's more than one way of thinking and doing and being. Um, so that that helps me a lot. But sometimes I do find myself almost in a defensive mode, trying to defend that for myself. You know, um, I'll get frustrated and, you know, and say, well, I, you know, it's OK. I'll use my husband for an example. You know, if I'm doing something and then he'll suggest another way of doing it. And then I want to get defensive because I want to say, well, what's wrong with the way I'm doing it? I'm going to get the same result. You know, I think about doing math, same thing. I had a math teacher, I could get the right answer, but I didn't show the work the way he insisted that we did. And so I would get it wrong. Like it was marked wrong. It wasn't college. So at least I wasn't a little kid, you know, but it was so frustrating to me. And I admit it, I dropped the class and I waited to retake it so I get a different teacher, <laughs> but that was the best I could do at the time. But, you know, there, there is a gray area. It's, you know, somebody doesn't always have to be wrong and there isn't always somebody to blame. You know, I think that's really important. I've had a, a change in my mind uh, just about this whole thing too, from when I was younger, I would view like whenever I wasn't able to be gentle or kind or patient or forgiving, it was always a negative thing in my life. Like, well, you've got to do better. You know, you're, you're in the wrong. This is a fault in you. And now I think it's definitely shifted more to God's desire for humanity is for us to get along, is for us to be unified and to love. And if that is God's desire in my life and in all of our lives, then God's going to give the power to help to do it in the moment. And so instead of um, being hard and negative on myself, just to take a deep breath and and admit in humility, I did it again. <laughs> I need some help in this, or this is how I really want to respond right now. But asking for God to help and to empower to choose the right way, the gentle way, the kind way over my initial reaction. And I don't get it right every time, but I think even just that mindset, my mind shift of this is what God wants. And so God's going to help me do it rather than feeling guilty. Remember what we said last week, Jesus never said, I did all this so you could feel ashamed and guilty. <laughs> uh, guilt is a terrible motivator. Um, but um, I, I like the way that you're reframing that mm -hmm. is that it can be um, about that inner healing and then uh, sharing that healing with others. Uh, we are getting close to uh, 7 11, which is a little later than usual. So I just want to ask if anyone has any, I never, uh, you know, sometimes you may have a thought that didn't connect with one of the questions or you uh, were struggling to get to get a word in or something like that. So I um, want to open that space if anyone has any final things they'd like to say or a uh, question they'd like to ask or something they'd like to contribute before we end our time together. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Tonight. What a... Uh, what a, uh, at least for me, a helpful conversation about some practical things that we all are going to go through um, in our normal everyday lives. And I was just sitting here looking at you all, thinking about all the different places that you all work and live and places that you uh, connect with people. And, you know, some of you are in different states, some of you are in different cities. And there are just so many small pockets of life that each of us is living. Um, and you may not be able to change the entire world, maybe, but you know, uh, you do in your own life have that ability to work for peace. Uh, and I think we address some uh, gentleness alone creates so much space for healing, so much space for love, um, and so much opportunity for God to be at work in your life and in the lives of those around you. 
So remember that Jesus said, you all are the light of the world. All y'all are the light of the world. That's what Jesus said. All y'all. <laughs> and so, so go out there and shine brightly. And uh, if you thought, uh, we kind of touched on something that was getting really exciting about the body of Christ and all of us being a part of that. Um, that is where this conversation ends next week. That's the big conclusion. So uh, if you thought that sounded like fun, you should join us next week uh, because that is the, that's where we're going to be uh, wrapping this conversation up. Uh, so before we go, I have, I found a, a, a closing prayer slash poem that I want to um, pray over you all tonight before we go. Go now in peace, never be afraid. God will be with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong, and true. Know that God will guide you in all that you do. Go now in love and show that you believe. Reach out to others so all the world can see. God will be there around you and above. Go in peace, go in faith, and go in love. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.